In our second to last conversation of the day, joining us on stage, venture capitalist Vinod Kosla. He's talking with Eric Newcomer. We're, we're in the home stretch, but two very exciting panels ahead of us. Uh, Vinod Kosla, thank you so much for sitting down with me. I read in the Wall Street Journal that you guys are, Kosla Ventures are raising a $3 billion fund. Is that right? Yes, it's right. We're almost done. <laughs> what, uh, you know, it's a time where many venture capital firms are sort of struggling or downsizing their fund size. I assume uh, the open AI investment helped along, but yeah, what, what was the decision to sort of expand it and what was sort of the fundraising environment like? You know, as Warren Buffett says, when others are fearful, it's time to be aggressive. When others are optimistic, it's time to be conservative. You know, one, one of the odd things about our fund if you look back the last five or six years, our rate of investing hasn't changed. So 20, 21, 22, we didn't like double our rate of investing. Generally, it stayed about the same. I do think in this new domain of AI, it's time to be aggressive and both thoughtful and aggressive. It feels like you're deploying more capital than many firms right now. Do you, I feel like there's concern that you know, valuations, you know, you're just paying a high price for AI companies and that we don't know anything outside of AI, we don't know what the bottom is or what prices will look like. How do you think about valuing companies in such an uncertain environment? You know, there's two styles of investing. And, you know, Instacart recently had an IPO that really showed up all the styles of investing. I've, I'll get the series wrong, but the first three rounds were reasonable valuations stepping up uh, and we stepped up aggressively, invested. You know, we started with a million dollars for at a ten million post, so we bought it at a pretty good valuation. Then the <laughs> very end, nice these days. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then we invest in the next series, and the next series, and the valuation got to a billion, and we decided not to invest. But what was happening was investors were doing momentum investing, so they're looking. Oh, he's investing at a billion, he's investing at a billion, I'm in. That kind of follow the herd kind of momentum investing is different than when you're investing in fundamentals. And we were investing in fundamentals. By the way, same time we invested in Instacart, in the same time frame roughly. We also put a million dollars into DoorDash at again a $10 million post because not too many people were investing in these areas back then. Right, and, and I mean, to translate, you know, early Instacart investors made money and <laughs> later ones uh, less right. so. Uh, right. Can you talk us through, given you know, uh, the AI audience, the investment in open AI? I mean, we had Reid Hoffman on stage, you know, he got in through his foundation, but you took the first venture round. What was sort of the dynamic there, and how did you just have the conviction for what seemed at the time to be a science project? Well, you know, Reed is very forward-looking. So I, I, I'd say, I, of all the people in the venture business, he's high on my list of people I really admire in how he invests. So I admire him a lot. In fact, but a venture fund like Greylock probably wouldn't want to invest in what was a speculative round. But the math was very simple. If you lose, you lose one times your money. If you win, you make 100 times your money. So you could place 50 bets. And if uh, 49 of the 50 lost, you'd still do OK. But it was much more than that. I started writing about AI, I think it was 2011 Christmas, I said, wrote about do we need doctors and do we need teachers with the idea that an AI tutor would do the right thing. And my wife has just a beautiful AI tutor. Uh, that's free, by the way, it's in a nonprofit. So I don't much care whether something's in a for-profit or a nonprofit. My son's working at Curie in an AI doctor. I wrote about that in 2012. What was clear to me by 2018, it was around this time we made the decision five years ago to invest in open AI. We'd already invested in a couple of uh, deep learning companies, actually oh, one or two that didn't work out and got sold for essentially aqua hire kinds of prices. But the fact that the companies didn't work didn't dissuade us 
because we fundamentally believed in the thesis. How much was it a bet on Sam Altman or the team versus the technology? Well, it was clearly a bet on Sam. We knew Sam and thought he was awesome. We knew Greg and Ilya and spent a lot of time with the team, and we really liked the team there. But more than anything, I'd long held this belief. 2012, when I first talked about can it replace essentially all expertise? If true, then the upper bound is unlimited, and it's great for humanity if that happens. And, and so from my point of view, the upside was huge, and it was important to make it happen. Was, was the structure? I, I have to give you a hint. There was an article in the New York Times with a, a writer called Laura Holson. In the year 2000, I said at some point in the next... I forget, next 25 years, I forget what I said back in the year 2000. I said AI will be so powerful, we will have to redefine what it means to be human. That was 2000, so I was already dreaming of <laughs> less, this kind less of Less crazy award. feeling now. Uh, the the nonprofit structure of OpenAI, were you worried about just like the structure of the company? It's still sort of a mystery to people outside how it works. Look, people get hung up on structure. That's the wrong way to look at it. If you're ta talking about changing the world, who freaking cares about structure? <laughs> we'll figure that out, and we did. You know, uh, when, when I worked with Sam that time, they had reasonable proposals, said makes sense. There wasn't a lot of negotiation. Is there some limit to how much money you can make off the investment? Yeah, yeah. The, they limited it because the for-profit, uh, non-profit nature of the parent company, which is fine. How yeah, we okay. make five billion on our fifty million dollar investment? Those are public numbers. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good outcome. Yeah. It seems and, more and likely, seems equally importantly, now. and this mattered to <laughs> Sam too. He knew I cared about the impact uh, OpenAI would have or an AGI would have. So now, now you want to go forward and invest in AI companies. You know, OpenAI just had Dev Day, where it seems like it's coming for every startup. How do you how do you think about where you can invest? to get more shots on goal on AI. So I was just talking to an entrepreneur outside, and I said, what was the sessions like? He said, uh, some of the speakers were more like, ChatGPT could have done that talk. <laughs> <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, people speak in generalities. <laughs> And ChatGPT does that really, really well. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, but the, que the question was, yeah, how you, what, what startups are you investing in sort yeah. of the AI world? <laughs> right. <laughs> this is a very tricky time to invest. There's a lot of very high valuations. And I've written about the fact that the very high valuations are bad both for the investors and the entrepreneurs. But just because the valuation is high doesn't mean it's, a, it's not a good investment. So I'll give you an example. There's a lot of billion dollar valuations, and we've looked at a lot of them. In fact, most of them. But when Adapt, uh, sorry, not Adapt, Replit. but uh, Replit came along, I thought because of conversations with the founder, great founder, and a fairly different mission for where they want to be in two years. Uh, we had a series of conversations about the future direction of Replit, and it's pretty different than what Replit was last year. And we invested at a billion dollar valuation because I thought they would create something that's now one of my, I have 10 predictions I've made, uh, I won't remember all of them, but one of them is within 10 years, there'll be a billion people on the planet programming, and, and what I mean by that is writing code by using natural language. That's a large enough change that it's worth a billion dollar valuation if it's successful. So it becomes more like, is Replet successful or not? And if it is, the valuation wouldn't matter. Most of the people who are chasing somebody else, their valuation matters a lot. We've, we've been sort of having a running. Hopefully ChatGPT wouldn't <laughs> give you a nuanced answer. <laughs> the, uh... We've been having sort of running conversation about existential risk. I'm curious what your view is of, you know, open AI sort of, you know, causing some real problem in, in the world. You know, I'm frustrated with the academics who have nothing to do but be academic. And they think about academic risks. 
the chance of a sentient AI going wild in the next 10 or 15 years is about the same as the chance of the asteroid hitting planet Earth in the next whatever years. I think this sentient AI talk is such nonsensical talk. And sensible people, like when, when, when I was talking to Fei Fei Li, you know, she said, there's more immediate risks to worry about. There's real risks that we should worry about, like bio-warfare. This morning, I was uh, at an AI security summit talking about bio-risk. Now, that's a real risk. There's cyber, cyber risks. There's a larger risk of falling behind China because President Xi has declared he wants to be the source of technological innovation in AI by 2030. Right? So they will put a lot of resources. Now, those kinds of dictatorial edicts don't tend to work very well. But uh, he has declared that. And I do think, uh, and I've written about this, we are in a techno-economic war with China. And we should do everything to win that war. Yeah. So, what, yeah, so what do you think Biden should do? That you're teeing up. Well, exactly I, what I you know, know, my recommendation is open up immigration to anybody with talent in this area. Talent. <laughs> you know, we have an advantage in the talent war, and that's what we should do. We should absolutely, really go after slowing down China as much as we can. So I like the restrictions we placed on China. Do you want to ban TikTok? I absolutely would ban TikTok, TikTok in the nanosecond. Wow, OK, we've got a real uh, disagreement here. <laughs> Reed said the opposite. Well, I, you know, I, I'm very clear. In the US, companies influence politics. In China, politics influences companies with total control. It's a very different system. And I'd be happy to debate Reid on it. Uh, there's no question. It has think, surveillance capability, and it has the ability to be controlled by the Chinese government. Well, to go one round with you, I think Reid's response would just be, what he really wants is American companies to be able to operate in China. And by that banning- That won't happen. <laughs> so you can dream all you want. There's no chance that happens. <laughs> You know, we've seen this for the last 30 years since we opened up. Uh, I, I'm persuaded. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, well, well think, of, think of the following. I feel like the audience is on your side on this one. The, the biggest control point influencing everybody from little kids to adults at the control point of consumer behavior is TikTok. And we know it works with the Chinese Communist Party. At the other end, with 5G networks from Hawaii, they have the ability to surveil about 60% of the globe's population because their equipment is in the networks. I think we should be very, very worried and not worry about sentient risks. You know, Max Tegmar can do that all he wants. He doesn't need to do anything real. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, are you, you know my style. It's <laughs> <laughs> That's why we had you here. Uh, are you donating? Are you going to get involved in this political cycle? Or what's your stance there? You know, I tend to almost always contribute. I've contributed over the last 15 years to both Republicans and Democrats. So I look at the candidates, not the party. And, and I like this general idea of a no labels party also, though I haven't contributed anything <laughs> yeah, to Yeah, are that. they gonna call you up after this to bankroll it? Have you talked to Manchin or anything <laughs> like that? I'm not a fan of Manchin because he's so opposed to climate change. Oh, interesting. And he's very parochial about Virginia coal. And so I'll never support Manchin for that reason. And, and climate is a very large risk for the planet, just like winning in AI is a large risk for the planet. And a few weeks ago, uh, I wrote a blog about that, uh, about our techno-economic war with China and why we can't do AI regulation to slow us down. Uh, I'm happy to uh, argue that, and I was glad to see much of the AI executive orders were considerate of this point of view. I spent plenty of time in D.C. talking to everybody about you're good at forecasting my questions. Yeah, do you do you think the executive order on AI was okay, or I think it was okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you worry it sort of signals worse regulation, or you're 
optimistic about the state you know, of the You know, it's really hard to tell. We're coming into an election year. It's going to be about the election, not about what's right. Let's, you know, that's the pragmatic path. That's the equivalent. Saying otherwise would be the equivalent of Reid saying, hey, American companies should be able to do X in China. Won't happen, you know? Uh, so I, I love Reid and respect him tremendously, but, uh, you know, we don't have to agree on everything. I do think the next year is about getting elected, and the next four years will be the important years. And it's too early to tell. And we have to get people like Lisa Khan out of, her <laughs> crazy <laughs> so, left-wing uh, kooky. <laughs> no Lena Khan at the FTC. Uh, what does that? Do you hinge any sort of Biden donation on something like that, or you can't do that? You know, there's uh, 300 million people <laughs> in this planet, uh, on in this country that. Uh, uh, he's not going to say, hey, I'll donate on condition of X or Y. Those never work. And it's unrealistic. There's lots of pressures on lots of people. You have to be practical about it. Uh, you know, you, we love your spicy takes. You've been doing this for 40 years. I, I interviewed you, you know, many months ago and asked you a similar question, but how much longer do you think you're going to stay sort of an active investor spearheading well, the Well, if our life extension uh, <laughs> efforts by Peter Thiel or whoever else is doing it uh, work, uh, no, seriously. <laughs> I have this saying, you grow old when you retire, you don't retire when you grow old. I've seen too many people retire and grow old. So I clearly plan to do, and health permitting, this for the next 25 years, and then I'll be Warren Buffett's age, and he's still doing it. Amazing. So, look, I'll do, th this is so much fun and so impactful and keeps me so engaged. I still work easily 80 hours a week, easily. Uh, You're so, always telling me some random paper you've read or... Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, I wanted to, sort of, the last couple questions at the end of this talk, just looking forward, like, do you think you know, the GPD-5 will be a major improvement like we saw three to four. What, what do you see in terms of, you know, where we are on the S-curve and how much improvement you think we're going to see in many of these companies? Yeah, look, one, it's very hard to forecast. Uh, but I think what GPT-4 was to GPT-3, and I have no inside information, and frankly, even the people of, uh, at OpenAI couldn't tell you what GPT-5 will be. But GPT-5, I expect we haven't seen anywhere near the limits of AI capability. That's a reasonable assumption. And so when I'm working with startups, I try and look at what five might have and six might have, and what might happen when five helps design six. So GPT-5 probably will help design GPT-6. You got this exponential effect. And the question for all of you becomes, which startups become roadkill in this process? And being thoughtful about that, I spend an incredible amount of time saying which startups should we invest in because they won't become roadkill in the- Are there no any categories you would suggest? Foundation well, there's model lots of categories. Or? There's lots of very, you know, if we create a billion programmers, you're gonna create real value no matter what the market That's thinks. a positive one. Yeah. But I've also forecast in 25 years, we'll have a billion bipedal robots. That will create a massive industry, larger than today's auto industry. And my bet is we'll have more than a million in less than 10 years. And somebody told me I was being too pessimistic. The last thing I wanted to ask you uh, was just what, what is your stance on open source right now? You'd okay. sort of been like, yeah. oh, I want a Manhattan Project, so skeptical. let me finish my thought. I do think in 10 years we'll have free doctors, free tutors for everybody, free lawyers so they can access the legal system. Uh, I'm in the process of writing a blog that is a good note to finish on. I'll, you will answer the open source question. Will AI lead to dystopia or utopia? Too many people are looking at the dystopia angle of this 1% probability of something bad happening and ignoring the benefits to humanity of AI and the 10,000 startups that are going to do truly wonderful things. And my job is to help them navigate the path forward. Coming back to your open source question, uh, I'm very much against open sourcing and AI. Keep That's in mind, shocking, right? What? Keep in mind, we were the uh, firm back in the 80s that literally started the open source movement at Sun. 
NFS was the first major piece of software that was open sourced. Uh, Linux came later. So I was very much an open source fa fan and what it adds to creativity. We are the investor, first investors in GitLab. It is the only, you know, people forget, GitHub wasn't open source. It was for open source software. GitLab was both open source and for open source software. So huge fans of open source. But in this techno-economic race with China, we will help them. And if we can slow them down by six months or a year, I think it's good for America. Vinod Kosa, always entertaining. Enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you.